Good morning. The title of the sermon, not allowing this divisive toxicity to seep into our church. The scripture is the lectionary reading for this Sunday from the 17th chapter of John, sometimes known as Jesus prayer for unity for the church. Jesus prayed for his disciples and then he said, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you father are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one so that the world may know you have sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them and I will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. So it's the reading of the word. We have spent quite a bit of time in worship as a church this last year, focusing on the 13th through the 17th chapters of the Gospel of John. Uh, this is the, a single discourse that takes place on the evening uh, before Jesus went to the cross, an evening that is often referred to as the Last Supper, there in that upper room. It is filled with powerful words and images. It begins with Jesus humbly washing the disciples' feet and saying that we are to humbly serve one another. It includes Jesus saying, you don't need to be afraid of death. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms. I am going to prepare a place for you. It includes Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father but by me. It includes Jesus saying, abide in me as I will abide in you. I am the vine, you are the branches. By remaining in me, you will bear much fruit. It includes Jesus saying, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now live in this love. It includes Jesus saying, I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. There is no greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Pretty amazing passages. And then it concludes with this uh, scripture from the 17th chapter, a prayer that Jesus prays to his father and on our behalf. And the center of that prayer is this idea of oneness, right? That they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, and they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. This oneness allows the whole world to realize this is something special. This is of God. This passage is unambiguously calling us toward a unity that somehow this oneness is the ultimate reality. This is no mere superficial unity. You see that in the way Jesus connects it to, to our very relationship with God. As you father are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. That, that in a sense, it's not just that we are connected to each other, but as we are connected with each other, we are connected with Christ and we are connected with God. We just finished up our class on Christian mysticism and these are the sorts of scriptures that we focused on. Jesus talking about a profound mystery, a mystical reality. Mystical means mysterious. That means we can never completely understand it. But we sense somehow it profoundly speaks to God. This is clearly what Jesus is calling us into. 
Yet there's a question that comes out as soon as you begin to talk about this unity. A really important question. To whom is he talking about? That's right. Who is to be unified? Who is to experience this oneness? So I want to think about that. Some different ways that we might uh, address that. So Jesus, John 17, prayer for unity, oneness, who's included? In some ways, that's a super, super important question that we have to address, we have to answer. So I'm gonna look at a couple possibilities. The first possibility is he's certainly praying to the people that are there in the room on their behalf. It says that's why he's praying, who he's praying for. So maybe it just includes Jesus, 11 disciples in the room. Judas isn't there. There's only 11. Judas has betrayed him. Um, Could that be who needs to be unified? Well, immediately, as soon as you think about that, you got to think about Judas. Uh, Judas was a bad disciple at that moment. No question about it. And yet, does that mean that we're only supposed to be connected to good disciples? That's right. Um, Hmm, kind of interesting. In that very same discourse, that 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th chapter, you find the most use of the word for love, agape, in any place in the entire Bible. There are 20 references, 20 times Jesus says the word agape. And agape means unconditional love. You know what that means? There's no conditions. That's right. There are no deal breakers. Even betraying Jesus is not a deal breaker as far as unconditional love. So that means that a real strong case can be made that Jesus calls for a unity that includes bad disciples, which is really good news since all of us are bad disciples on a regular basis. Yet what if Judas has become an enemy? Does that unity include people that might be enemies? Well, believe it or not, this may seem kind of shocking, but a good case can be made that it even includes enemies. That's right. Uh, Jesus talked about enemies in a way that shocks everybody, then and now. Here's what Jesus said about enemies. Right from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you have heard it said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's what we normally do, right? But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. We human beings love to demonize. Uh, Generally, when you talk about someone as the enemy, that's a demonizing. Yet Jesus makes it really, really hard to demonize. Uh, Jesus takes that away, that joy of demonizing that we human beings seem to love so much. Jesus is really a (laughs) killjoy. Seriously, though, demonizing is practically off the table if we are serious about following Jesus. We'll come back to that one. All right. So it's it's not just the 11. It's definitely including uh, Jesus, the 12 disciples. Yes, including Jesus, Judas. But you know what? Even as you look at that, you kind of realize right away, it's got to be more than that. That's right. There's more going on. That brings us to the third one. Jesus has this to say. Jesus prayed for his disciples, and then he said, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. So very clearly, Jesus is talking about a bigger circle of people than just those that were in the room. So, kind of a a, a broader possibility of who is included is the disciples in the room plus all followers I'm aware of, right? Yeah, I need to include those folks. This is the practical interpretation for most Christians, by the way. 
This is the way unity is understood. In fact, there's even a word for it, and the word is ecumenical or ecumenism, um, which is simply taking this idea pretty much from this scripture, right? The principal aim of promoting unity among the world's Christian churches. So all those churches that identify Christ as Lord and Savior, we include them. That's what we're to do. But as soon as you say that, it causes you thinking, doesn't it? Is it possible that it's maybe bigger than that? That's right. That it's not just those that I recognize and know that perhaps there's, there's even more to it. If you're thinking that, um, these words might sort of speak to that. All who will come to follow Jesus based on my definition of following Jesus. That's right, you know. So even though people that don't call themselves followers of Jesus, you know, as I understand what following Jesus is all about, what it means, folks that do that, they're also a part of that. Well, Jesus actually has something to say about that directly. And uh, as we're broadening it, it's pretty much in line with where he's going. This is an amazing scripture. It's almost like Jesus is sort of reading our mind as we're thinking about who's included. It's from the 10th chapter of John. So this is the same gospel, the same gospel just seven chapters earlier. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. What Jesus is saying here is there are gonna be folks that we do not know about, that we do not expect. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. So the definition that we have of this fold, it's bigger than that. And we don't even know who those folks are. That's right. And so <clears throat> that little my kind of my definition sort of gets pushed on. All who come to follow Jesus based on my definition of following Jesus, that's not broad enough. Yeah. Because it includes folks we wouldn't recognize. And so the fifth and the last one all who will come to follow Jesus, past, present, future. Yeah based on God's definition of following Jesus. That's right. That's right. Not based on my understanding. My understanding is limited. My understanding is faulty. My understanding is often rather parochial. It's based upon the way I was raised and taught. No, it's not based on my definition. It's based on God's. So the question it kind of comes up is how big a deal is this, right? I think at different times it's been answered in different ways, but I believe right now this is incredibly relevant. That's right. Who we are connected with is one of the fundamental questions of our day because we're living in one of the most divisive times in history. That's right. Right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not a great thing to be living in because it sounds so heavy, and it is. There's a term that uh, I, don't, I, I doubt that I made it up. I probably heard it somewhere, but, but if you've been around the last few years, you've heard me share it on a regular basis um, because it's, it's a statement that we have used to talk about this church, not allowing this device of toxicity to seep into our church. That's right. Yeah, this divisiveness, which is the opposite of the unity that we are called into, <clears throat> that is toxic. Yeah. So this has been a, a pretty tough week. That's right. Um, in our prayer time, we're going to be praying for the people of Texas that uh, are just reeling 
from the tragic shooting of 19 children and two adults. An evil almost beyond comprehension. And yet before that happened, the other story that at least was on my mind a great deal was um, the report that came out of the Southern Baptist Church, a report that they hired an outside firm to look at because folks have been saying for quite some time, uh, something's wrong, something's deeply wrong. And that report came out. And uh, so this is, uh, you know, it's, it's been all over the news, but this is from the Christian Broadcasting Network. So this would be kind of a sympathetic um, publication, you would think. Stonewalling and even outright hostility, Southern Baptist report shows mistreatment of abuse victims. So I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, in my previous job as a superintendent, that was my job. That was one of my responsibilities was to deal with abuse uh, whenever it came up. Yeah, certainly the last thing you want to have to deal with, but yeah, dealing with it. So I, I've, been, I've, been, I've been looking at this with great attention and with great sadness, deep sadness. Some of you um, are familiar with Russell Moore by now. He's a theologian I respect a great deal. Um, even though theologically, he's much, much, much more conservative than me. Um, Russell Moore currently is the public theologian for Christianity Today. Christianity Today is the publication started by Billy Graham in the 50s, uh, generally seen as sort of the, the, the chief spokes magazine for evangelical Christianity here in the United States. He was the former chief theologian of the Southern Baptist Church until two years ago when he, uh, he left that church, the church that nurtured him, that he grew up in, the church that his wife grew up in, and um, they left that church because they felt they had to. They felt that, that they were not hearing anything that was being said by him and many, many, many other people. What he said was that really, because the Southern Baptist Church is so big, they have such a responsibility that they sort of represent evangelical Christianity. And what is at stake is really the future of uh, evangelicalism. That's what's at stake. By no means is he, was he the only person that was sounding an alarm, although he was maybe the first and maybe the loudest. Um, Beth Moore, the wonderful Bible teacher and evangelist, uh, she left three years ago. Um, very same thing. Sex abuse was not being dealt with. And uh, so this is last week, Beth Moore, famed evangelist who left Southern Baptist Church on sex abuse report. You have betrayed your women. So what, what, what happened? What happened? Well, in some ways, it has a little bit to do with this idea of, of unity, or the idea of, of our connection as, as the church of Jesus Christ made up of different expressions, different flavors. About 25 years ago, um, and I was pretty close to this because as it was happening, I had gone back to seminary at, uh, at, um, at Asbury Theological Seminary, which is in Kentucky, and the second largest uh, seminary in the Southern Baptist Church is in Louisville. And so we kind of saw up close what was going on. It's generally referred to as the, the fundamentalist takeover of the Southern Baptist Church. And by the way, that's how, I guess you would say both sides describe it. That's right. That's not seen as a pejorative. That's seen as often the way it makes sense. Uh, they talked about the moderates and they talked about the, the fundamentalist and the fundamentalists, they were able to take charge. Um, but it wasn't just like, a, you know, sort of in this country, there's a sort of change in power and then things can shift back. They completely took over all the machinery of the church and put it in, in a way that is almost undoable. Some of you may remember that's when Jimmy Carter left the Southern Baptist Church. Uh, not because he didn't believe in the, the, the theology and uh, uh, what is core to the Baptist Church, but he felt that the church had abandoned, had abandoned its own faith. 
In a sense, what happened was the Southern Baptist Church declared war on liberalism. Um, That's the way they described it. Liberalism became the enemy. Uh, Liberalism was seen as not Christian. And it had... um, It had infiltrated that church too much and they needed to eradicate it. It was like a cancer. And so they went to war. Uh, Part of that, there's a number of different pieces of it, but one piece of it was that they got deeply involved in politics in a way they had not gotten involved in politics before. And so it wasn't just liberalism in terms of theology, it was liberalism in terms of the country. And uh, that became an epic battle. They also decided that women could not be ministers. Uh, Believe it or not, the Baptist Church, Southern Baptist Church was one of the first churches to ordain women. And they had ordained women for over 100 years, but they decided women could not be ministers. And um, they, even though it's Baptist polity that the local church makes decisions about that, they decided it wasn't gonna be the local church's decision. They were gonna weed those churches out and essentially boot them out of the denomination if they had women, um, sometimes even just in leadership, but certainly as pastor. As this unfolded, um, boy, I saw the change. Um, There was a huge number of Southern Baptist women planning on becoming ministers that shifted to Asbury Seminary because in the Methodist church, we ordained women. And so that was something that they had a possibility of pursuing their calling. As it went on, um, another tendency that sort of fell into the church was this idea that um, they were the visible expression of the church and uh, therefore um, it was almost a perfectionism that, that who they were was not just an okay expression of the church. It was the absolute expression. And uh, everyone else was either off base or actually heretical. And so there was no more confession that was allowed for the most part. Um, There was no more acknowledging mistakes. And uh, this idea of doubling down really sort of took over. That when a mistake is made, no, it's not a mistake. We're gonna double down and triple down and quadruple down. And that sort of took over the church. Well, Russell Moore, lifelong Baptist, chief theologian, about seven years ago, he realized that this had become toxic and um, that there was a divisive toxicity, to use my term, he didn't use that term, but a divisive toxicity that had taken over the church. And uh, he was calling it out. He was calling it out. And uh, eventually it caused him to leave and go over to Christianity Today. Some of you remember a a sermon I maybe preached, I preached about three months ago. And uh, it was one of the principal figures in the Southern Baptist Church, Jerry Falwell, his son, uh, the famous preacher's son who started Liberty University, his son Jerry Falwell Jr. um, had this precipitous scandal it was a sex scandal and a money scandal and a abuse of power scandal and a, pol- a politics scandal, all of that wrapped into one. And uh, he came out in January and he did a lengthy, lengthy interview. He did va- with Vanity Fair, a secular publication, and he shared his story. And, uh, and in that, he shared that it was a confession he said, you put me up on a pedestal like I'm somehow this leader of the church and I'm not a role model at all. He says, because of my last name, people think I'm a religious person, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm a horrible role model. Well, when this happened, I mean, he was, he was crucified, castigated. The church went after him like you wouldn't believe. But Russell Moore said, wait a minute here. This is exactly what needs to happen. This is what we need to be doing. He's doing what Christians have always done. When we make mistakes, instead of doubling down, tripling down, quadrupling down, we acknowledge what we've done. We admit our sin and we've stopped allowing confession in this church. And 
So he wrote this incredible article. Um, Jerry Falwell Jr. isn't a hypocrite, right? They were saying he's a hypocrite. He wasn't a hypocrite. He was confessing what he had done. It was, should have been commended instead of castigated. So right now, Russell Moore is, is, is saying this, this needs to be uh, an apocalypse. It can't just be a little bump in the road. He says there needs to be a complete, a complete conversion of the church. We've gotten to a place where this device of toxicity has taken over. Our involvement in politics has destroyed us. And this idea of culture war has put us in a place, this war footing is not the way the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be. We're not to be on war footing. This idea of a culture war is not the way to approach it at all. The hiding of this abuse um, was because it, it was believed that it would taint the church if they were open about what was going on. And now what he says, it's far worse because we we, we, no one will believe us anymore because we've been lying again and again and again. Russell Moore calls action of SBC leaders blasphemy following release of sex abuse. So he had been calling this out for some time and this is, this is what consistently he had been told. They told those of us fighting for reforms to prevent sexual abuse crimes in our church They said such crimes rarely happen among people like us, right? That's what happens to those liberals. That's not what happens to us, Uh, uh, conservative evangelicals. That's right. Uh, These things don't happen with us. For years, leader in the executive committee said a database to prevent sexual predators from quietly moving from one church to another, to a new set of victims had been thoroughly investigated and found to be legally impossible giving, given Baptist church autonomy. That's what the church said. We can't do anything. There's really nothing there, but even if we wanted to, we couldn't do anything. Ro- Moore wrote, my mouth fell open when I read documented proof in the report that these very people not only knew how to have a database, they already had one that they had used to protect themselves. There were 700 pastors and leaders in the church that had abused women and particularly children that were being protected. What Russell Moore is saying, and I think he's spot on, but it's not limited to the Southern Baptist Church. What he's saying is that this idea of a culture war that creates a, an us that is faithful and a them that is the enemy is the antithesis of the way we need to operate. It sets us up for exactly what has happened. It allows this sort of device of toxicity to, to take over the church. We will become cultural warriors. We will not be faithful followers of Jesus. Does that mean the values that we worry about in the culture are are not to be addressed? Absolutely not. It's it's not that we we don't take these on. But we don't take them on a war footing. So last week, uh, um, I was bragging about us. I was invited to to do a series of, uh, of conversations uh, with the retiring pastor of Los Altos and talk a little bit about myself and a little bit about you. That's right. And uh, where we've been. And one of the things I, I talked about was a decision that, that, that I and, and Neil and, and the leadership of this church made early on that we were not going to allow this device of toxicity to seep into this church. We were going to do everything possible that we could to, to prevent that from happening. The only problem was we had no idea how to do that. <laughs> That's right. It was, a, it was a powerful idea. It made complete sense to so many of us. And yet, how do you do that? So we've done all sorts of different things over the last six years. And uh, some of those haven't worked. Um, not that they were destructive. They just didn't necessarily prevent that. But a number of them did. And I shared these four things. 
Number one, careful attention to avoiding language that divided. Avoiding the many trip wires that cause reactionary responses. So we're very careful about our language. Because sometimes when certain words are used, people just shut it down and they stop listening. We try to be, we try to be mindful of what those words are and not speak in that language of division. Number two, there's been an intentional effort um, in sermons and classes to bring in both sides or multiple sides uh, to try to understand it um, uh, not just from one perspective, or we're right and they're wrong, but, but to try to understand a variety of voices, especially when we presented a new idea. Number three, frequently acknowledging that we didn't know. That's right, acknowledging times uh, that there was ambiguity and uh, there was no blueprint. And so I can't tell you how many times that I don't know. I don't know. We acknowledge that. We don't know at times. And number four, and this was the most important. We didn't demonize people or groups of people. That's right. Uh, We were fierce in not demonizing. Now, that doesn't mean you can't talk about things, but there is a difference between demonizing, and I think we know what it is. When you talk about someone having a different idea, even if you may agree with, disagree with it, that's different than demonizing them. When you demonize them, basically you say, they're not us, they're other, they're heretics, they're wrong, they're not real Christians. We did not do that. And I shared, I think one of the outcomes of that is that we, we made it through the pandemic surprisingly well. We didn't allow the election to divide us. Many churches divided uh, over politics, especially over the last five years. And, uh, and that didn't happen. We didn't have people angrily denouncing, I'm leaving the church because this church is such and such. That's not to say people didn't drift away, but we also had folks that were drawn to this church because we had created a safe place, a place where people knew that they weren't gonna get demonized, a place where there wasn't one uh, theology or one politics that somehow everyone had to belong to. Most of you know, I say all the time, I learn more from people I disagree with than people I agree with. We're living in a time where a church like ours, a diverse church theologically, a diverse church culturally and politically, uh, even though we don't talk about, you know, intentionally talk about politics, there's, there's a deep awareness that we're a diverse body. This is becoming a rarity. And yet I believe that this is the most authentic expression of the gospel of what it means to be the church and being true to that prayer that Jesus prays for us. That's right, that we would be one. Not because we all think the same way, not because we don't have passions that may, that may uh, be very different, but because we share a unity in Christ. And so that even though we may disagree on certain things, we agree that we are seeking to follow Jesus. And my way may be a little different than your way, but you know what? I can bless you and you can bless me. And so this prayer this day is really the, the scriptural undergirding of what we have been doing for the last six years. And I think it happened before then as well, of not allowing this divisive toxicity to seep into our church. I've talked with Pastor David Johnson coming in a lot about this. And he's also of the same mind that this is the way the church needs to be. Thanks be to God. Amen.